Commitments and competition law, what next after Google? The European Commission has made increasing use of a procedure under Article 9 of Regulation 1 2003 to resolve EU competition law cases without imposing a fine. The commitments procedure has featured in a number of high profile investigations including proceedings against Google and Gazprom. This session will consider the experience so far and the implications for future investigations. We are now going to speak to Suzanne Rabb, EU and Com Competition Law Barrister at Seoul Court Chambers in Lincoln's Inn regarding the commitments process. Suzanne, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I've been um, advising on um, EU and UK competition law for about 15 years now. I advise on the full range of competition issues from mergers, cartels, abuse of dominance, state aid and, and procurement in a wide range of, of industries, but with a particular focus on industries that are um, subject to sector regulation or have a heavy intellectual property component. Thank you. And, and what is the legal basis for the EU commitments procedure here? The commitments procedure at EU level um, was introduced um, on the 1st of May uh, 2004 under Article 9 of Regulation 2003. And that regulation brought about significant changes in the procedural framework of EU competition law. What Article 9 does is it allows the European Commission to bring an end to uh, a competition investigation which it may be conducting under either Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU which deals with anti-competitive agreements or Article 102 of the same treaty which deals with abuse of dominance. And by accepting these commitments from the parties, the Commission can end the investigation without imposing a fine and without concluding that there has been um, an infringement. This legal procedure uh, should be distinguished from Article 7 of, um, of Regulation 1 2003 which is the legal basis for the Commission's infringement um, decision in such investigations where invariably the Commission will impose a fine and will make a finding that there has been a violation of EU competition law. I mean these commitments seem positive and a good thing for the EU to be introducing but are there some distinct advantages and disadvantages that can be addressed here? Um, undoubtedly, uh, the, the procedure um, when it was introduced was considered to be um, an innovation. Um, looking at the pros and cons, it's helpful to distinguish from the perspective of the European Commission, investigated parties or even third parties. So from the Commission's perspective, there are um, advantages in terms of savings, in, in terms of time, resources um, in the commitments procedure um, by bringing a swifter resolution to an investigation. Uh, if this procedure is not used, sometimes investigations can drag on up to even five years at the European Commission level the Commission is able to secure through the commitments procedure a much more consensual resolution to an issue because the investigated company is involved in deciding what the commitments are, are to look like and, um, and can ensure a much more market-oriented um, outcome. There are some downsides from the Commission's perspective 
even though commitments are offered and accepted by the Commission, that does not necessarily mean that there will not be challenges through the courts. So that is not necessarily an end to, um, to the procedure. If one then turns to the perspective of individual companies, again, it, there is a minera image because they too are able to benefit from a speedier resolution. The stigma attached to infringing competition law may be less because there is no actual finding of competition infringement. And there are savings in terms of management resources, professional advisor fees in fighting an investigation um, to its conclusion. On the downside, again, the fact that an administrative investigation by the Commission has been resolved does not insulate the investigated companies from potential private litigation which may follow from um, the, the procedure. Then again, if we look at the perspective of, of third parties, third parties typically have an opportunity to import on the scope of commitments. They will frequently be complainants. Um, so the, the process of consultation on commitments allows them to import into the, um, the final resolution that, that may be um, secured. Again, the downsides of, of this procedure um, from the perspective of third parties is that they enjoy lesser rights in terms of, of challenge to, to commitments. Uh, should they wish to launch um, proceedings through the, the courts by way of private litigation, they do not have the benefit of a commission finding of infringement, so would have to prove both infringement, causation and loss if they sought to um, bring private litigation in the courts. So it's certainly not a binary good thing or bad thing. There are various interdependencies to consider in, in weighing up pros and cons and depending on which perspective you're looking from. So are there any limits on the types of cases that can be resolved using the procedure, the commitments procedure here? Not all cases are suitable for um, resolution by commitments. The Commission has issued guidance in a memorandum stating the types of um, case that would be amenable to, to using the commitments procedure. So the first is that the parties have offered commitments and that's an important qualification because there is no obligation on investigated companies to offer up a solution. The second is where um, it would not be appropriate to, to impose a fine. So in the case of very serious hardcore cartel investigations, the commitments procedure um, is not considered suitable. Um, and that's mainly because there is a real deterrent um, policy behind cartel enforcement um, where, where fining is part of the Commission's armoury and sending a message that those practices um, are not to be tolerated. And then there have to be various efficiency savings in bringing the, the case um, to an end through, through this route. If there is one underlying feature that I've identified in the cases that are more suitable for commitments, they tend to be ones which are not as straightforward in terms of the legal theory of harm and, and the evidence. And in those circumstances, there is a real tension between the desire of the company to hang out as long as possible in the belief that there isn't a legal basis um, for the Commission to find that they've violated the law. At the same time, the Commission is also aware of that and if a market outcome can be secured um, that at least brings about some changes in behaviour, um, that may be considered um, a good solution from the Commission's perspective. So is it a straightforward procedure? What is the exact procedure involved in commitments cases from the Commission's perspective? 
The, the procedure can differ in terms of um, the timing and, um, and scope depending on, on the circumstances of, of the case. Um, but there are some, some very clear um, milestones um, that, that are um, to, be, to, be, to be observed. So in order for the commitments procedure to be, to be um, available, um, the Commission um, must have initiated proceedings in the case and it will typically do that in the form of an, an announcement on, on its website. The investigated companies um, will have been in some form of dialogue with the Commission before that. There may have been um, a dawn raid. So that initiation of proceedings will not come as, as a surprise. The Commission will also issue what is called a preliminary assessment which sets out the theory of legal harm that they are maintaining. Um, they may even issue a statement of objections um, to an investigated company which will give an opportunity for an oral, oral hearing. The investigated company will have a period of um, up to a month at least to comment on the preliminary um, assessment, which would typically be a separate document from the statement of objections if issued. At that point though, there may have been some dialogue between the Commission and the parties as to whether there is a basis for offering um, commitments. So it's not as mechanical as certain steps following after others. There may be quite an iterative process. If a party offers commitments, it will offer these in writing to the Commission. There is no blueprint on how to do this, but often the model form of divestiture commitments in mergers can form a starting point. The Commission will then issue um, an invitation to comment on those commitments to, to, the, to the public, to complainants and, and third parties. The statement of commitments will be redacted to remove um, business secrets. That procedure will typically be open for, for a month, maybe, maybe longer. And depending on the nature of the third party feedback, there may even be a need for, for further rounds of, of consultation on commitments. If the Commission is presented with a form of commitments which it believes addresses these concerns, it will then issue a decision under Article 9 announcing that it has accepted the commitments and the publication in the official journal of that decision um, will be the, the final stage in, in the commitments procedure which will formalise um, those obligations that the investigated company has agreed um, to, to undertake. Suzanne, can you just run through with us what types of commitments may agreed, be agreed and what sort of remedies they might entail? Commitments can be um, either um, structural, which are, are changes um, to, to the structure of the markets, which may even involve a divestiture commitment. And that has been a feature of um, many of the investigations in the energy sector. So the Czech energy incumbent CEZ agreed to divest various network assets to resolve um, an investigation under Article 102. So very, very intrusive remedies can be possible um, under the, um, the commitments procedure. Perhaps lesser forms of structural remedy um, can, can be agreed. An example in the Continental um, Airline Lufthansa um, investigation, their commitments on, on slot availability. So, um, again, very similar to a, a structural remedy. Behavioural remedies, commitments on conducts um, are also um, typical. These have ranged from pricing remedies, 
For example, in a case involving Rambus, Rambus agreed to a five-year royalty cap um, on, it, on its royalty um, receipts. Um, but even more innovative um, types of remedy, such as making information available to, to third parties. So there is, there is no limit on the, the types of, of solution that can be, can be offered. And with the commitments, um, do they usually tend to be legally binding? How long would they ordinarily last? And, and can, can the courts challenge these commitments? Commitments will typically be in place for uh, a period of, of, of five years. It would certainly be open to the parties to apply for them to be modified, in principle even by the parties themselves if there had been a major change in the, um, in the market dynamics such that the commitments were no longer necessary the commitments are legally binding and if the investigated company fails to abide by the commitments the commission can initiate a case against them and impose a fine up to 10% of turnover or 5% um, on a periodic basis for every day of non-compliance. So the sanctions can be quite draconian in terms of the, um, the mechanisms that are available to secure compliance. You also asked about whether the, um, the courts can challenge um, the commitments. Typically the process would be the commission issuing a decision that the parties um, hadn't complied. But what has been quite interesting in terms of the history of enforcement has been the actions by third parties challenging the validity of commitments and, and, and the investigated company's compliance and even the, the need to, to modify commitments. There has been a recent case um, which has challenged um, commitments that Repsol agreed to. Uh, the General Court has confirmed um, in quite a categorical judgment in February this year, 2014, that there was no basis for uh, revisiting the um, original um, commitments. So clearly the courts there sending a message that um, they will not lightly reopen commitments. That um, they will... What happens when it's third parties who are the complainants in these scenarios? Are there any cases that have developed this point? The, the Al Rosa de Beers case has clarified the scope of um, rights of, of third parties. So this, this case initially involved an investigation by the European Commission into the purchasing of rough diamonds um, between Al Rosa and um, de Beers, who at the time were the largest um, producers of, of diamonds in, in the world. It initially began as an investigation under both Article 101 and 102, under which both Al Rosa and De Beers were addressees. Various rounds of commitments uh, were offered. The final round were offered by De Beers only, where the commitments were that purchases of rough diamonds would be phased out. Um, over a successive period, resulting in Al Rosa finally purchasing um, zero from, from De Beers. Al Rosa then challenged those commitments and the case went from the General Court to the European Court of Justice. Ultimately, the European Court of Justice um, ruled that the commitments were valid, they were legally enforceable, that the Commission had not overstepped its powers by accepting those commitments. It was De Beers as the undertaking concerned in offering the commitments to resolve the Article 102 case, 
who had the um, had the more uh, extensive rights in this case. The status of Al Rosa was merely that of a third party in these proceedings, albeit quite a special third party because they were the counterparty to the purchase agreement. They were not able to challenge these commitments. The Commission had to do no more than satisfy itself that the commitments offered and accepted by it were sufficient to remove the competition concerns identified. There was no obligation on the Commission to seek out different solutions or even more proportionate solutions. So the case has established that under the commitments procedure, the rights of third parties to uh, disrupt the commitments that have been put in place um, are certainly less extensive than those of the, the undertaking concerned. Obviously, the undertaking has offered the commitments and the extent to which it can then backtrack on those um, is, is a moot question, has not been tested. But I can certainly envisage circumstances where a party has offered commitments and could still challenge them before the courts if there had been some procedural error in the process which had led the, um, the party to, to offer up commitments which might be more extensive than it had done had there been procedural due process. Suzanne, some recent concerns have been raised by EU Competition Commissioner Al Munia in respect of the Google search case, um, and that's been something of major discussion recently. Um, Google has actually avoided a fine in this case. Can you tell us why that is? The, the European Commission had raised concerns that various practices of, of Google in relation to its, um, its search and advertising services were uh, discriminatory, that they preferred Google's own vertical services such as, as shopping, shopping sites. And where we are in this procedure uh, is that Google has offered various commitments to seek to resolve um, the concerns that the Commission has, has raised. Um, but we are certainly not at the end of, of the process yet. The commitments that Google has, has offered um, remain subject um, to, to consultation. And Google's obviously a multinational company. It's available across the world. How, how have other authorities such as the US regulators raised similar concerns mm. such as these? The United States Department of Justice had very similar concerns um, relating to exclusivity, the lack of transferability of certain advertising um, from um, Google to, to third party platforms, the practice whereby Google would prioritise its listings of its own sites relative to, to third parties and also another practice known as scraping where Google was taking content from other sites and, um, and loading it on its own, own site. The US um, Department of Justice did not ultimately um, bring a case against Google under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, which is the equivalent to Article 102 of, of the treaty, which is the provision that Al Muna is proceeding under. Um, in the US case, the Department of Justice did secure some minor concessions from Google, um, allowing third parties more flexibility in terms of using um, their advertising campaigns elsewhere. But there was certainly no court action by the Department of Justice challenging um, Google's um, behaviour. Um, and that's, that's, that has been criticised in some fora. Um, and all eyes are certainly looking um, on the EU to, to see what forms of concession that, um, that may be possible here. The particular form of commitment that um, has sparked um, quite a lot of debate is Google's offer um, to display at least 
three um, alternatives um, on the search page with equal priority to its own sites um, and that is is designed to um, to change consumer behaviour so that they don't automatically um, get at the top of their, their search screen um, only Google sponsored um, services. And the fact that they've agreed to do that, will that bring a cl some closure to this or do you think it could be challenged in the EU courts? Well, at this stage, we can by no means um, assume that um, these um, these these commitments will be will be accepted, and the comments made here are are being made before those commitments have have been finally um, accepted. Um, assuming that uh, some form of commitments are accepted. Um, at that stage, that does not rule out further challenge by third parties. And already um, complainants have expressed their dissatisfaction that the commitments do not go far enough, that, um, that they still will not remove the imbalance in the market that favours um, Google. One particular complaint that has been made is that third parties in any event need to pay Google to appear in the priority listing and the concern there is that will somehow skew the market in favour um, of Google. So it's by certainly um, no means the end of the road even if commitments are accepted in this case and there remains prospect of, of challenge through the courts. As I mentioned in relation to the Al Rosa de Beers case, the rights of third parties are less extensive in terms of challenge, um, but um, they do have um, grounds for challenge if they can show that they are sufficiently and individually concerned um, by, um, by, by the, the issues. So they're obviously being used in more cases and more, by more companies and by much larger companies. Mm -hmm. Do you think there will be more use of commitments in future cases? Well, initially expectations were, um, were, were probably exceeded in terms of the volume of commitments that would be um, offered and, and accepted. I'm certainly anticipating that the trend we have seen so far shows no sign of, of relenting. And that is for a number of reasons. Um, one is, is certainly the obvious savings. Um, the other is a more strategic approach to competition law enforcement, where investigated companies and complainants are becoming increasingly sophisticated in terms of, of their approach to regulatory strategy. The Commission, again, is showing no let up in terms of the types of cases that it will be, be launching. Uh, we have two particular cases um, that have shown themselves as, as prospects for commitments. One is the abuse of dominance case against Gazprom, um, another um, a case involving um, patent litigation on involving Samsung. Um, so there, there are clearly cases in the pipeline, trends and drivers, which suggest to me that this will be a very fertile area um, going forwards as it has been over the last 10 years. And looking at these cases faced with this experience, companies will obviously be asking themselves whether or not to commit and what's in it for them. Do you think it's a good idea for them to do this? To commit or not to commit, that is the question. And uh, forgive me from, from quoting from, from Hamlet there, and um, I will say that I do not have credit for using that quote in this, this context, um, but uh, there has been a recent statement um, by, um, by the, the Commission um, representative, um, Italina, who has said that um, there is a fine trade-off and what commitments offer is, is a halfway house between um, an infringement decision and a fine and um, proceeding um, without any um, confines on, on conduct. 
it is not as easy as saying yes or no. And it's, it's that dilemma which, which companies will, um, will increasingly face. There is also a balance in terms of how much to commit if it's decided to commit and when to offer hard or soft commitments um, in terms of how intrusive they are because inevitably there is an element of negotiation um, and that will be subject to third party comment. So there is a, a fine balance between offering too much and then having to beef up the commitments to, to allay um, some negative feedback which may emerge from the market. Is the current position on these commitments satisfactory, Suzanne? Co commenting as, as a lawyer, I am a believer in the commitments procedure to the extent that it offers parties options. But I do have um, two concerns. The first is the enormous power that this vests in the Commission to secure a market outcome and a concern that a view of how a market should look and function um, may exert unwarranted pressure on parties to offer more than they would be legally obliged um, to do. We've seen that in the energy sector and I do believe it remains um, a concern. The second area um, where I have some um, reservations is, is from the perspective of how is the law developing. These are cases where the Commission does not make an infringement decision. In terms of the precedent value, if we can even speak of that in EU law terms, is, is, is obviously less than an infringement decision and does create um, questions as to, to what is the law. And it's particularly challenging advising in sectors where there are fewer decisions, limited guidance by the Commission and very speculative theories of harm. So looking forwards, um, this is certainly not a call for more infringement decisions, but there needs to be sufficient cases that are actually dropped because there is no ground for action or which reach the stage of a formal finding. And it is only then that there is sufficient confidence that we do have a robust um, and developing um, legal system where the boundaries of acceptable conduct and um, unacceptable are more clearly drawn. Thank you.